Well, what do you do when, when you fail, when you sin? I mean, when you, when you really mess up big time and you feel terrible about it. When you thought you finally had that addiction conquered, but once again it creeps back into your life and gets the best of you. Or, or when your sin hurts people, when, when your sin hurts the very people you love the most. Or when you've been entrusted with the responsibility of leadership, but instead of leading people in the right direction, you lead people to stumble spiritually. When Adam and Eve sinned, they hid themselves from God. They felt ashamed. They felt embarrassed. They didn't want to come to God. We have a tendency to do the same thing. When we sin, when we feel terrible, we don't feel like coming to God. We don't feel like meeting together with other Christians to worship God. We feel like doing exactly the opposite. We feel like Adam and Eve. We feel like running away from God. But what we need to do is we need to come to God. And we need to come together as God's people and worship him. That's, that's how God heals us. That's how God restores us. That's how God revives us. And that's what Jacob and his family needed to do in Genesis chapter 34. Last week we read Genesis chapter 34. And it was a very disturbing chapter in the Bible. We saw that in that chapter, God is never even mentioned, not once. No one prays to God. No one worships God. No one seeks a word from the Lord in Genesis chapter 34. In that chapter, Jacob failed to be the leader God called him to be. He failed to protect his daughter from rape. He failed to protect his sons from seeking revenge. In their anger, Simeon and Levi slaughtered all the men of Shechem. And then the sons of Jacob looted the city. They went through every building, every house, and they took anything of value, including the women and children. Jacob and all his people needed to repent and come back to God. And praise God for chapter 35, <laughs> because that's what happens. Jacob and his people come back to God. This is the first revival recorded in Scripture, Genesis chapter 35. And God calls it. God calls them to come back to him. In Genesis chapter 34, God was not even mentioned. But here in chapter 35, he's mentioned 11 times by name. And 11 more times in names like Israel and Bethel. As we read this chapter, we see here in Genesis 35 that it's not free from problems. They still struggle with sin. They have to mourn the loss of three dear loved ones in this chapter. But it is here in chapter 35 that they learn how to repent of their sins. They learn how to come back to God. And they learn how to revive themselves spiritually by trusting in the Lord. And that is a powerful lesson for us. Here in this chapter, we see some practical principles that will help us to come back to the Lord in those times when we feel terrible, in those times when we have sinned, in those times when we have failed. This passage also shows us how God can work through us to bring about revival. Whether it's people in our families or people in our church or people in our community or the entire nation. God knows our nation needs revival. Here in this chapter, we see principles how God can work through us to bring about revival. And brothers and sisters, God wants to work through you. He wants to work through your life to bring people back to God. 
We see how to do that. We see how we can cooperate with God and allow God to work through us to bring people back to him here in this chapter. As we read Genesis chapter 35 today, let's speak to God. Let's pray and ask him to speak to us through his word. And uh, let's, let's go to God right now and pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word. We know that when we sin, you want us to come back to you. So God, I pray that as we read this chapter today, that you would speak to us, that you would draw us back to you, that you would revive our spirits. God, I pray that your word, your powerful word, would accomplish the purpose you have for it in our lives today. And that as a result, we would be instruments, tools in your hands, not only coming back to you ourselves, but also being used by you to lead others back into a relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 35. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of your foreign gods that you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress, and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had, and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell upon the towns all around them, so that no one pursued them. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan, there he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel. That means God of Bethel. And Bethel means house of God. So God of the house of God. Because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried under the oak below Bethel. So it was named Alon Bakuth. After Jacob returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you. And kings will come from your body. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you. And I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at that place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar at that place where God had talked with him. And he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. When they moved on from Bethel, while they were still some distance from Ephrath, Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, don't be afraid for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named him Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. But his father named him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. Israel moved on again and pitched his tent beyond Migdar el Eder. While Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine Bilhah, and Israel heard of it. Jacob had 12 sons. The sons of Leah, Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. The sons of Rachel's maidservant Bilhah, Dan, and Naphtali. The sons of Leah's maidservant Zilpah, Gad, and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. 
Jacob came home to his father Isaac in Mamre near Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years. Then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now, there's obviously a lot of material in this chapter, and all of it is God's word, all of it is important. But today, I want to focus on the first 15 verses of this chapter where we see this spiritual revival taking place. I want to focus on the idea of coming back to God. God called Jacob and all his people to come to Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. That doesn't mean that God is confined to a geographical location. That doesn't mean that you can only experience God at certain places on the earth. This idea, come back to Bethel, has a spiritual meaning. It represents coming back to God spiritually. It represents revival. This was symbolic. And this was a deliberate decision for Jacob and his people to repent of their sins and come back to sincere devotion to the Lord as the one true God. It was the same commitment Jacob made when he first came to Bethel, when he left his father's house, when he was fleeing from his brother Esau on his way up to Haran. He stopped at Luz. It was called Luz at that point. And that's when he had the dream of the ladder going up into heaven. That's when God spoke to him and and gave him the promises that he had given to Abraham and Isaac. And that's where Isaac made the commitment, God is going to be my God. But what about us? How does this chapter apply to us? What do we see in chapter 35 that can help us when we have sinned, when we are feeling terrible, when we need to come back to God? How should we respond to Genesis 35? Well, first of all, let's get rid of our idols. Let's get rid of our idols. You know, in our culture today, we do have idolatry. The idols that we see in our culture today may be very different from the ones we read about in the Bible. But don't be fooled. In our world today, we have many idols that are clamoring for our attention And they can look like many different things. They can look like a beautiful car, a beautiful house, a nice job. They can even be things that aren't necessarily evil or bad, maybe even good things, but things that disrupt our priorities. An idol can be anything that draws our attention away from God. Anything that becomes more important to us than God. An idol can be anything that prevents us from putting our trust and hope in God. In the Bible, the false gods of the nations often distracted the Israelites from trusting in God. From recognizing that the Lord, Yahweh, is the one true God. And we see that here in this passage. In verse 2. Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. You know, it may seem strange to us that the patriarch, Jacob, who who believes in Yahweh, the the one true God, and, and has presumably taught his children to do the same, it may seem strange to us that he's saying to his family, Get rid of your foreign gods. That seems strange. Well, remember, not too long ago in chapter 31, Rachel stole her father's idols. Her father never found them. And we don't hear anything more about it. So she probably still has them at this point. And remember back in the previous chapter, in in chapter 34, After Simeon and Levi killed all the men, the sons of Jacob went in and plundered the city, took everything of value from every house. Undoubtedly, 
there were some valuable gold and silver idols that they also took. And even if the sons of Jacob did not believe in those foreign gods, it would still be a tremendous temptation to hold on to those valuable items of gold and silver. But Jacob said, get rid of it and purify yourselves. And that's the attitude that we should have about anything that distracts us from God, about anything that becomes more important to us than God. We need to get rid of it. And notice that Jacob is not just talking to his family here. It says that he was talking to all who were with him. Remember, there are a lot of women and children from Shechem that the sons of Israel took as servants. And there were probably other people who came with them from Haran. And so Jacob is calling all of his people to turn to the one true God. These people from Shechem didn't know anything about Yahweh. They didn't know anything about the one true God. Jacob is calling them to leave that sinful culture of their past behind them and put their trust in the one true God. Look at what Jacob says in verse 3. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and who has been with me wherever I have gone. Jacob was not only returning to God, he was also returning to the responsibility of leadership that God had entrusted to him. God had called him to be the spiritual leader of his family and of all the people who were with him. Look at the invitation he gives. Come, let us, let us go up to Bethel. He uses that first person plural pronoun, us. He includes himself in the invitation. That's something we should do whenever we're calling people back to God. We need to include ourselves in the invitation. He recognizes that he himself also needs to come back to God. Let us go up to Bethel. And then he gives his own personal testimony about this God he's calling all these people to follow. He says, this is the God. This is the God who answered me in the day of my distress. None of our idols are going to help us when we're in trouble. None of our idols will answer us in the day of our distress. There's only one God, the one true God. And he is the one who answers us in the day of our distress. He is the God who cares for us. He is the one who is there for us when we're facing difficulties, challenges, and troubles in life. He calls upon us. He invites us to cast all our anxieties on him because he cares for us. Jacob also says, this is the God who has been with me wherever I have gone. Wherever I have gone, Jacob knows that the one true God is not confined to a geographical location or, or a physical image. This is the God of the universe, the God who created heaven and earth. He is omnipresent, and he knows by experience that this God has been with him everywhere he has gone. He has seen his hand guiding him, leading him through difficulties in life, whether he was at Bethel or up in Haran or halfway in between. Everywhere on his journey, God has been there for him. None of those idols will be for us, will be there for us wherever we go. They won't answer us, they won't help us, and they won't be there for us. When he called his people, to go up to Bethel with him. He knew that God was not calling them to a geographical location. God was calling them to a spiritual location, a change of heart. God was calling them to a different mindset. 
And this is really what Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 3 when he says, set your minds on things above. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. God was calling Jacob and his people to a different mindset, to a spiritual revival, to get rid of their idols, to get rid of their sins, to get rid of all those things that were distracting them from God and come back to God in their hearts and in their minds. God calls us to do the same thing through Jesus Christ. When we set our minds on Christ and the new life that God wants us to have in him, then we're not distracted by the idols of this world. We initially do that when we put our faith in Christ. When we're baptized into Christ, we become children of God. We are spiritually revived. We come into a relationship with God. All our sins are forgiven. We have the Holy Spirit living within us, and he helps us to become more like Christ. But that's not just a one-time event. That doesn't just happen at our baptism and then we forget about it. No, we continue to purify ourselves. We continue to get rid of our idols. We continue to keep coming back to God. We have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and continue to renew our minds and continue to come back to God every day. John put it this way in 1 John chapter 3, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. As Christians, we're not perfect. Yeah, we still stumble. We still make mistakes. We still sin. But if we're God's children, we're going in the right direction and we're continuing to make course adjustments and we're continuing to walk by the Spirit and follow His leading, His guiding in our lives. We recognize that God has a plan for us. He's shaping us. He's helping us to become more like Jesus. And when Jesus returns we will receive that glorious, immortal, imperishable body, resurrected, a body that is no longer prone to corruption and disease and sinful temptations, but a glorious, victorious body that will last for all eternity. John says here, everyone who has this hope continues to purify himself. And that's what Jacob was calling his people to do. Get rid of your idols and purify yourselves. How should we respond to Genesis 35? Well, let's remember our blessings in Christ. God knows that we tend to be forgetful. So he calls us to do things that will remind us of the blessings we have in Christ. We just took the Lord's Supper. That's one of the reminders that God has given to us. We need to do this every week because we're forgetful. And we need to remember the blessings we have in Christ. When God gave his promises to Abraham, he didn't just do it once. In the book of Genesis, there are seven times that God reminds Abraham of the promises that he has given to him. And we've read about two different times where God reminded Isaac of the promises he's given to him. And here in this passage, this is the second time that God has repeated the promises he's given to Jacob. God wants us to remember the blessings that we have. Look at verses 9 through 10. This is uh, the beginning of the 
the promises, the second listing of the promises God gives to Jacob. After Jacob returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And as we go through this passage, we see that these promises really have two parts. Uh, the first part is here in verses 9 through 10. And this first part is a reminder that Jacob has a new identity, a new name. He's not going to be called Jacob. He's going to be called Israel. And this is a reminder of what happened back in chapter 32 when Jacob wrestled with the angel and he asked for a blessing. And God told him, okay, your name was Jacob. It's not going to be Jacob anymore. It's going to be Israel because you've wrestled with God and men and prevailed. And so here, God is reminding Jacob of his new identity. Remember, you're a different person now. You're a new, you're a new man. You have a new name. Remember, I named you Israel. You know, as Christians, God's given us a new name. He's given us a new identity, and sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we need to be reminded of our new identity we have in Christ. We are children of God. We are disciples of Christ. We are saints. We are holy ones. That's what God calls Christians. In the New Testament, the, the, the Bible never calls Christians by their sins. That was our old identity. That's what Satan wants to identify you as. Don't adopt those names. That's from your past. That's who you used to be. God's given you a new name in Christ. You are beloved. You are chosen. You are God's people, God's children. You are holy. We need to remember our new identity in Christ. That is a powerful blessing. The names that God has given to his people. That is a powerful blessing. The second part of God's blessing to Jacob is in verses 11 through 12. And here we see promises that he's given to other people in the past. We see promises that he gave to Adam and promises that he gave to Abraham and Isaac. He gives them to Jacob. God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. That's what God said to Adam and Eve back in Genesis chapter 1. And a nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. What did Jacob do to deserve all these great blessings? Nothing. <laughs> he didn't do anything to deserve this. This was completely by God's grace. God blessed Jacob by his grace, through faith. And God wanted Jacob to remember that. You know, as Christians, we've also received God's amazing grace through Jesus Christ. We've received his grace by our faith in Jesus. And we need to remember these blessings that we have in Christ. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 2. Paul says, remember, in verse 12, remember that at that time, back before we were Christians, at that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, now in Christ, now that you're Christians, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We have been brought near to God. All our sins are washed away. They're all forgiven. We have a good relationship with God. He is our Father and we are His children. And the Holy Spirit is living within us. That's a tremendous blessing that we have in Christ. Not only that, but because of Jesus, we've also been given the blessings that God gave to Abraham. That's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3. He says, Christ redeemed us. That means he paid the price for us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us 
in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Jacob experienced the blessings of God in his life. Jacob said, this is the God who has been with me wherever I have gone. He knew that he had received these blessings that God promised to Abraham and Isaac because God kept leading him and guiding him and being with him wherever he went. Well, guess what? As Christians, we have an even greater blessing. Not only is God with us, God is living within us by His Spirit. This is the promise of the Spirit, and we received this when we were baptized into Christ. We received the promise of the Spirit living within us. Yes, God is with us. He's leading us. He's guiding us, and He's shaping us. He's helping us to become more and more like Jesus. The promise of the Spirit is an amazing blessing that we need to remember, a blessing we have in Christ. How should we respond to Genesis chapter 35? Well, let's give God our best worship. Let's give God our best worship. You know, when we get rid of our idols, when we get rid of all those things that distract us and keep us from coming to God, and when we remember all the blessings we have in Christ, should it not be our natural response to show gratitude to God? Should it not be our natural response to give him our absolute best worship? And that's what happens here in Genesis chapter 35, verse 14. Jacob set up a stone pillar at that place where God had talked with him, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured out oil on it. After hearing those promises, those blessings again from the Lord, he couldn't help but worship God with all his heart with all his strength, with all his mind, with all his soul. He gave God his best worship. And this is the same response that Jacob had back in chapter 28 when he was at this same place. When Jacob left his father's house, when he was fleeing from Esau on his way up to Haran, he stopped here at Luz. And he took out a couple of rocks and laid his head on the rocks because he didn't have a pillow. He went to sleep, and God gave him a dream. He showed him this ladder going from, from earth up to heaven, and angels going up and down on the ladder. And Jacob looked at the top of the ladder. He saw the Lord God Almighty, and God spoke to him and gave him these promises and told him, I'm going to be with you, Jacob, wherever you go. I'm going to bring you safely back here to the promised land. And Jacob, when he woke up, he was amazed. He said, this place is awesome. Surely this is the house of God. And that's when he first named it Bethel, house of God. It had a profound effect on him. This was an amazing experience that changed his life. But it was a personal experience. It was just him and God and the angels. No one else was there. I'm sure that Jacob told this story to his wives and to his children many times before they came back to Bethel. Because this was a pivotal moment in his life, a life-changing moment. But you know, when you have one of those experiences, one of those events that change your life, that, that shapes you in a profound way, it's hard to communicate that to people, you know? I mean, you, you could be the best speaker, you could be the best writer, you could have, you know, uh, high quality, high definition photos and video footage of the event, but it's still not the same as actually being there and going through the experience. And I'm sure there were times when Jacob tried to tell people what this was like and what happened to him, and he probably felt frustrated because he knew he wasn't he wasn't getting it across to people. God told Jacob to bring his family to Bethel. He told him that for a reason. And, and the reason wasn't because there's something magical about Bethel. It wasn't because God could only be experienced at this one place on earth. 
It was symbolic. It was meaningful to Jacob. It was the place where God changed Jacob. And so God knew that coming back to Bethel would awaken Jacob's heart. It would remind him of how God changed him. It would remind him of the vow he made to God. And it would motivate him to be the spiritual leader he needed to be. And to lead his people, not to a geographical location, but to a spiritual condition. A condition of the heart. Sincere repentance. Sincere devotion to God as the one true God. Jacob wanted his family to understand this life-changing encounter he had with God. And the best way to do that was to lead them in worship, in sincere worship, pouring out his heart, his soul, his mind, all his strength in God. When we come to God with that kind of heart, with that kind of sincere worship, it shapes us. It has a powerful effect on us. We need to give God our best worship. This action of pouring out a drink offering was symbolic of pouring out your soul to God. Worshiping God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Bethel means house of God. But again, this is not talking about a a, a physical, geographical location where God is confined to dwell. This is talking about a spiritual location, a location of the heart. Sincere repentance and sincere devotion to God, giving God our best worship. You know, when Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman, woman at the well, It wasn't far from this location. Matter of fact, you know the well where they were at? That was a well that Jacob dug in the town of Shechem. (laughs) Jesus visited that place where the sons of Israel slaughtered all the men of Shechem. And there at the well, he talked to this Samaritan woman. And and the woman wanted to know about the correct geographical location to worship God. She asked Jesus, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, it's it's not about the location. They say location, location, location. Jesus said, no, forget that. It's condition, condition, condition. It's your heart. It's not about this mountain or Jerusalem. It's about your heart. He said, an hour is coming, and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is looking for people who will be his worshipers, who will worship him in spirit and truth. I wonder if he'll find that in us. You know, when we think about the blessings we have in Christ, it should be our natural response to give God our best worship. That's what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12. In verses 1 and 2, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, when we consider God's mercy, when we think about the cross, when we think about the grace we have because of what Jesus did for us, In view of God's mercy, it should be our response to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Giving God our best worship means living every day as an act of worship, no matter where we are. Not just on Sundays, not just in a church building, 
but 24-7, every day of the week, wherever we are. We are a living sacrifice in response to God's glorious grace. And when we think about the blessings we have in Christ, that renews our minds, it transforms our hearts, and it empowers us to live for God. That being said, we do need regular times of gathering together as God's people and worshiping Him, giving Him our best worship together as God's people. That's what God was calling Jacob and all of His people to do. Come to Bethel together as one people, as God's people. Worship God together, giving Him your best worship. That's what it means to come back to Bethel. It's not about a geographical location. It's, it's about God's people coming together and worshiping Him with all their heart. You know, when we sin, when we feel terrible about ourselves, we don't feel like coming to God. We don't feel like gathering together with other Christians to worship God. But that's exactly what we need to do. Because that's how God heals our broken hearts. That's how God repairs the damage done by sin. And that's how God restores us and revives us spiritually. Come back to Bethel. Come and worship God. Give him your best worship. We're going to pray and sing one more song. As we do that, let's think about how we can respond to God's word today. Let's get rid of our idols, all those things that distract us from God, all those things that are taking priority over God. Let's get rid of all that. And let's remember the blessings we have in Christ. Let's think about the fact that we have the Holy Spirit living within us. We have forgiveness of sins. We have this relationship with God. We have all eternity to look forward to. Let's think about the blessings we have in Christ. And let's give God our best worship. Let's love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. After we pray, we'll sing one more song. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the call that you've placed on our hearts. God, we know that our country needs revival. We know that our communities need revival. God, we, here, we are here to confess that we, we need revival. God, thank you for calling us back to you. God, help us to let go of those things in our lives that are distracting us, pulling us away from you. Help us to get rid of our idols. And God, help us to take inventory on the blessings we have in Christ. God, I pray that powerful message of the gospel would penetrate our hearts and reveal to us just how blessed, how, how awesome your promises are and how, how wonderful your blessings are in our lives. I pray that that would be a powerful motivation for us to come back to you. And God, I pray that as we come back to you, we would give you our absolute best worship and that you would be glorified. God, as a result, I pray that we would be empowered and equipped to help others come back to you as well. I pray for revival in this country, in our communities, in our families, and in our church. We pray this in Jesus' name.